Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll start. Uh, I mentioned this before. Uh, the slides are available online now. If you want to go check them out, there's links and resources contained within them. Uh, so if you are a note taker, I got the notes ready for you. Um, they're available at the URL at the top, uh, emarchac.github.io slash drupal dash in dash the dash start. Cool. <laughs> Uh, so hi, uh, this is Justin Longbottom. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm Aaron Marchak, yeah. Uh, I am a, a Drupal developer. I've been working with Drupal since six. Um, the version, not the age. Uh, <laughs> I've um, also done another presentation uh, ex that's focused on accessibility in Drupal, and that's one of my specialties. Uh, the other one of my specialties is uh, getting myself into trouble. So this is a presentation about that. Um, and I've worked with uh, Drupal 8 on several production builds and uh, have wor done work with uh, Drupal 8 and React and uh, decoupled and progressively decoupled environments. And I'm Justin Longbottom. Uh, I'm a developer at MyPlanet as well. Uh, I've been doing Drupal for about, I don't know, six years. Been building web apps and web applications for about 10. React for a year now, um, and uh, yeah, so happy to be here today to share what we've learned recently with you guys. So. Damn, we're both from my planet. <laughs> um, oh yeah, it's Justin. You, you can see there. Um, we're a uh, technology company out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, we specialize in making. Um, usable and beautiful products for the enterprise environment, uh, web and mobile. So our essential mission is to get the user experience that people expect from uh, consumer apps and bring that into enterprise and um, uh, corporate internal environments. So uh, we're, we're hiring, uh, we're really nice. So if you wanna come visit us in Toronto, uh, we can go see a Jays game, but that's us. Um, and I'm gonna actually start this presentation with a story. Uh, there is another company in Toronto that we're very good friends with, and they're called Heliolytics. And what they do is they specialize in uh, auditing solar panel installations. They use aerial photography to go uh, to these. I, I'll explain why this connects to Drupal in a second. I see that you're confused. Um, but this is a real company, and uh, they take aerial photography of solar panel fields and identify um, the panels that are broken and they return uh, to the owners of the fields, the maintainers of the fields, uh, with a graph saying where it's broken. And this is particularly interesting because uh, they do this uh, with aerial photography, so it's in large mass. And these solar fields, I don't know if you've ever been to Arizona, but like they're in the middle of nowhere. So it's very far to get to, it's very difficult to get to. Um, and when you go there, uh, there's actually no guarantee of any internet connection or cell phone connection. So um, Heliolytics has this problem where they pass off the grid of uh, broken solar panels. So you can see here, this is the photo. They've, the light panels up there uh, are the ones that are uh, not working. And then they give the technicians that go out into the field this grid. And they know where the solar panels are, but it's really difficult to communicate to the technicians exactly which solar panels are broken, where those solar panels are located, and any kind of more information uh, with it. On top of that, uh, these fields can be hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers. They're very large, and uh, they're in remote locations. So a technician has to go print off the sheets that indicate what's broken, drive all the way out there, try and find where these individual uh, panels are broken, and address the issues. So there's uh, hours of difference. There's missed connectivity. Um, and there's a lot of different uh, issues that you have to handle. And to make sure that the technicians that are working uh, on these fields have the correct information that, that is up to date and that they're able to interact with is really important. And that's a problem because if we give them a website uh, or uh, an application, um, they, they're gonna miss the connectivity when they go offline, when they go off the grid to visit these fields. Uh, or if they choose to go and print out the documents and then drive all the way out there to make sure that they have it, um, the documents could be 12 to 24 hours or even longer. Um, they could be out of date. So while these people are working in the solar fields, how can we actually help them solve the problem? So to solve the problem of solar, 
we're going to have to go in the dark. Do, 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 do. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's, this is the presentation Drupal in the dark. Um, and so what we're going to cover here is a few examples of business cases and use cases for why having an offline ready Drupal environment that uh, customers can use to engage with their content in an online and offline and dynamically changing world. Uh, we're going to go through a few more business cases and then um, <coughs> some goals that we had with this presentation. Uh, in building this presentation, Justin and I really started exploring and pushing the boundaries of what we knew how to do uh, with Drupal. So uh, we had some technical goals and things that we wanted to answer as developers as we were going through this and developing this. Um, when building out our offline Drupal environment, uh, we used a specific set of tools and, and the toolkit, and we'll go through that. Um, and then we're going to go through uh, the, our exact build process. We're going to give you a demo of the application to show you how it works. Uh, so there's going to be a little bit of, a lot, there's going to be a live demo. So <laughs> it's offline ready. So if the internet goes down, we should be okay. Uh, cross your fingers for us anyway. <laughs> um, we're then going to talk about some security implications in an offline um, and headless environment. Uh, and then finally, we're going to go through some afterthoughts and looking forward. So there's a lot to be, there's a lot to pack in here. Um, we're going to ask for questions at the end to make sure that we cover everything. Yeah. Hopefully we have some time for that. So uh, why decouple Drupal 8? There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of dialogue lately about it. Uh, Dries mentioned it in, in the keynote. Thank you. Um, lots of articles posted by Aquia lately about it. Um, so it definitely seems to be a direction a lot of people are interested in. Uh, I would hesitate to call it the future of it, but there's certainly an API first uh, initiative in Drupal 8. Uh, we were fortunate enough to attend the Acquia Partner Summit on Monday. There was a round table about uh, the API first initiative uh, hosted by some excellent members from Acquia. Um, so that, that was really informative and that just sort of reinforced this notion that uh, decoupling is, is sort of a, a direction that a lot of people are interested in. Um, so that's sort of why we got interested in this. Uh, we sort of witnessed the, the dialogue and we, we want to participate in it, further it, experiment with it. Uh, and so we're hoping to show you guys basically uh, what we've learned, what we still need to learn, uh, the, the trials and tribulations of the prototype that we've built here, um, and just sort of the supporting modules that helped us put this together. And there's been, um one of the things that in this list is uh, Lullabot recently redid their whole site to be decoupled and offline capable. Um, and there's some interesting technical choices that they made that uh, are different and we're going to talk about uh, what's unique and what's different uh, between Lullabot's choices and uh, different ways that you can pick yeah. uh, the technologies that are out there. Yeah. And just adding to that, um, there's sort of this notion of uh, progressively decoupled sites. So it's sort of, there's a spectrum of decoupling. You can have fully decoupled or partially decoupled. Um, and so we, we've worked with a lot of uh, progressively decoupled sites, sort of having little React components that we've embedded to, to generate a nice UI. Uh, this is sort of taking it all the way to the one end of the spectrum with fully decoupled. And then we add offline capable to that, to the mix, just, you know, just to make it extra fun. Um, so that, that's sort of the rationale behind it. Uh, X debug has crashed. <laughs> um, so in doing and researching the de decoupled, uh, we found that the <coughs> business examples that the community has largely been talking about uh, have been kind of uh, wanting, for lack of a better word. Uh, it's very easy to talk to a developer and say, we want to build an offline capable application and the developer to get really excited because <laughs> it's new and it's exciting and uh, it's somewhere that we haven't gone. But it's difficult to go to a business or a client of yours and to say, I want to build an offline capable application, they're probably going to be like, what? Does it cost more? And you're like, yes. And they're like, no, don't do this. <laughs> um, so uh, having the ability to talk to business cases and uh, uh, yeah, use cases for offline, I think, is really important. Um, one of the uh, business cases that we've seen a lot, and I very much agree with, is uh, commuters taking public transit, where you expect them to be online and offline uh, a lot, and you expect them to disconnect and have partial connectivity. Um, yeah, another one would be just basically in general, uh, intermittent connectivity. You can't always rely on the internet if you're maybe taking the subway and an airplane. Uh, so traveling is obviously a big barrier that 
creates the need for offline capable. If you come to Dublin and then you forget to pre-buy a cell phone plan. That happened yeah. to us when we landed, so those sorts of things. Um, and obviously technicians that work in remote locations. So that's what uh, Aaron was alluding to earlier with the, uh, the solar company. Um, just, you know, we're, we're, getting the, we're getting good coverage, but it's not, it's not everywhere. And so this sort of helps bridge that gap. Um, and so when we started looking into this and we started developing it, uh, there were some specific goals that we wanted to actually achieve with this implementation. Um, we wanted, uh, yeah, to stop treating lack of connectivity as an error. Yeah, so one site we stumbled on when we were kind of doing some research, I'll switch over to that tab because I won't paraphrase because they do a good job of it here. And I'll just read that out to you. We live in a disconnected and battery powered world, but our technology and best practices are left over from the, the always connected and steadily powered past. So basically, we have phones that'll die, we have grids that are inconsistent. Um, so offline first is sort of, a, sort of initiative or a way of thinking about it. Um, you've probably all heard of the, the phrase uh, mobile first, which is a term, let's say maybe, maybe 10 years ago that started, you started hearing a lot, um, basically developing for certain devices or mobile devices first, having that in mind first throughout the development process um, this is sort of analogous to that, um, sort of offline capable first. So sort of having that in mind throughout development. Mm -hmm. I heard a really good quote uh, at this DrupalCon that it was, um, ah, the, like the software that we're building is in a perfect environment. We have perfect control over it, but it's built on top of an imperfect network. It's the physical world. It's not going to be correct. And so to assume that you're going to have complete and perfect connectivity is just false. Um, another technical goal, view all the content all the time. Um, so, so sort of the, the idea is that when you first visit the app or the website or the page, you kind of download a copy of it uh, into your pocket if it's your phone and you have it with you, or you wherever you go. Once you're offline, you kind of have the whole site. Uh, this, is, this is different than caching where you have to view it first or whatnot. Uh, in, in this, you sort of get a whole copy of the database and, and you have it stored locally. Um, so that's sort of the difference there. Um, and, and, you, and you're able to write and uh, read the database locally. Like there's a, you're able to perform CRUD operations locally and then have it connect afterwards. It's, there's not a disconnect between what you're able to see and then what you're, when you're able to actually perform those additional actions. Yeah. Uh, our, and our last technical goal was uh, connecting Drupal with React uh, without the middleware. So often, uh, often there's sort of a middleman interface between, uh, between Drupal and, and your application. Uh, and one of our technical goals was to have the app communicate directly to Drupal uh, using some APIs that we uh, set up uh, in Drupal 8. Yeah. And the, the Lullabot example, um, if you follow their kind of implementation, they did uh, do a really, really nice decoupled Drupal 8 with uh, Pouch, which was what we did, but they chose to uh, put a middleware in between. And so we wanted to see what would happen if we took the middleware out. So we'll, we'll get into that. Cool. Um, so this demo was built on 8.1. Um, so there are some requirements that we have there that are not going to be true in 8.2. Um, the reason why we used uh, Drupal 8 specifically, we mentioned before that we've been doing some uh, decoupled work in Drupal 7. Uh, I don't need to rant to you guys about why Drupal 8 is better, but predominantly it's able to match the speed of React and it's able to be just as performative. So that's a really key issue. Um. So the suite of modules that we used for this, uh, they're listed there, Relax being the main one. Uh, I don't know if any of the maintainers are in the room, but we want to <laughs> give a shout out to you. Uh, we, we probably were bugging you on the issue queue a little bit. Um, yeah. Yep, so that's good. Um, so yeah, that kind of helps smooth things over for us. So we definitely had an experimental mindset coming into this, just trying to see what we could do. Um, so we we're happy to kind of participate in that a little bit. Um, but yeah, so. So this suite of modules, um, I'll switch over to the Relax one. Relaxed one. <coughs> Oops. Uh, so we are relaxed. Oh, I had it open already. So, the, so the suite of modules, the, you can recognize them. They all have this little blue cloud. Um, there's a lot of codependency between them. They work together very well to uh, provide the architecture that we needed to to make this happen. Um, and if you go down a little bit. Well, this is exactly our, our use case, and we actually are using CouchDB. Um, so we sort of uh, use that as a, a guideline, I guess, for some of the prototypes that we are building. Um, 
we're actually able to do this, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, without writing any custom Drupal 8 code. Uh, we use these modules and the built-in Drupal 8 services uh, to make this happen. So, so that's, that's kind of cool in our opinion. Most of, the, most of the heavy lifting and the code writing that we did for this was actually on the React side. Uh, so Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 really, uh, really made it easy. Um, one note in Drupal 8.2, and I just learned this recently, the cores module, which is cross-origin uh, resource sharing, is now in core. Uh, and that's one of the key modules, and, but we'll get into that a little bit later, I think. Um, but yeah, thank you to the maintainers. <laughs> Sweet. Um, the other side of the application we built with React. Uh, the reason why we chose React for this is uh, we have been using it a lot recently, and it was what we were most comfortable with, which is, I think, the first step when you're trying something new is to keep as many variables consistent. Uh, one of the reasons why we choose to use it, I mentioned before that we do enterprise applications, and React is really, really, really nice uh, to use in that sense because it's, uh, as I have here, uh, it's for building large application with data that change over time. So it's um, stateful, so it's really nice to be able to handle different uh, elements of state. You have composable, declarable, compo or declarative <laughs> components, so each component is inherently contained within and of itself, so you're able to understand and be able to manipulate and share that without, throughout the application. Yeah, and it obviously works well with Drupal 8. Um, so a little background story. Um, we've done a decent amount of progressive uh, decoupled work in Drupal. Uh, this is sort of a case study, I'm gonna run through quickly for you guys. This is actually a Drupal 7 site uh, that we built. Uh, it's progressive decoupled, meaning we have pages with React, single page React apps built into it. Um, that was sort of our foray, our entrance into, uh, into doing this sort of React work with Wait. Drupal. Oh, sure, you wanna open that? Yeah, keep talking. Okay, um, so the way this is set up is we basically have a React app that consumes uh, some JSON data from an API, and we built like a really nice search interface for it. Um, the, the, the rationale behind this is views when you have huge sets of data. Every time you change a query filter, uh, even with the you know, Ajax turned on, it has to make a round trip to the server. Uh, it can be slow, it's not as responsive. The, the idea here, because we're dealing with huge sets of data, is let's deliver everything to the client app on page load and do all the filtering and updating uh, client side. It's very snappy, very fast, and if you go down a little bit, yeah. I'm getting there. There yeah. it is. So here it is. So it's it's bas basically a vacation planner. When they when the page loads, it says give me all the vacation options, every departure, every permutation of boat, every price, every add-on, every passenger number. Um, it's a lot of data. And if you're, I mean, maybe you could do that in views. It would probably be a really painful experience, uh, especially with all these complicated filters. Uh, some of the filter widgets that we're using are nice little uh, React libraries that we've leveraged. Uh, it was resulted in a really snappy, uh, wonderful experience. Um, so basically, that's, that was sort of how we got into React and decoupling. Uh, and now what we wanna do is kinda take it to the next level, have fully decoupled app. Um, yeah, that's sort of the, the background. Uh, the other thing that we've, um, we chose here is uh, within the React environment, you have a bunch of options for offline syncing and data stores. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here uh, regarding the different ones. Um, the one that we chose here uh, was Pouch to Couch. The, uh, the main reason was because uh, Relax came with it and I'm lazy so if somebody else is doing the work to make sure it's connected, uh, great. Um, it's also, as we said before, it's focused, specifically it's focused on offline first and that's the main uh, target of Pouch. Yeah, um, I guess I jumped ahead earlier but yeah, the idea is have all the content all the time download a copy to your pocket. Um, it's kind of, kind of a cool idea. Uh, one thing Pouch does really well uh, that we found is resolves conflicts and kind of race conditions you can have. We were trying to break it earlier, have two people editing the same node in the React app and the, the Drupal side, and it seems to resolve that pretty well. Um, Pouch is it's basically a JavaScript implementation of the, the Couch standard. Um, so it's, yeah, fully client side. Uh, just worked really well. It was very dev friendly. Uh, we'll show you some snippets in a bit. It was pretty easy to get up and running. Um, it, it did a lot, again, a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, so yeah, we were able to use this tool and other tools very well to, to build this. Um, and Pouch uh, was 
supported by most major, like obviously not IE6, but most major modern browsers, Pouch is able to use, uh, to go in and use. And I believe there's also a uh, Pouch native. So you can actually start doing some more native applications if you're using uh, React Native on top of React DOM. Yeah. But we'll show you how easy it is. So this is all the code you actually need to have a live syncing application once you have a, your uh, React scaffolding up. And uh, we'll show the React scaffolding. Um, but you have uh, the, you create a local instance of your pouch that's keyed with whatever you want. Uh, you create a remote, remote instance of the pouch object, which is targeted to your uh, remote endpoint. And then you use the sync function. And then you're done, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, and this, ha this inherently handles all the conflicts. Um, we'll show you how to do a live syncing. So this is uh, syncing on demand. Um, but you're able to use different flags to do live. And it works with uh, JavaScript promises. So you're able to do really, really nice asynchronous code. So we were ready. <laughs> Everything was good. We had the supplies. We're ready to kick some butt. Uh, so we built it. Um, and now we're going to show you how. Cool. Um, so the first step in building this is uh, we actually had to set up Drupal. And as we mentioned before, we really didn't need a lot of additional modules. Um, for this example, we installed uh, one outside of here, which was just a, the geofield module. Um, but uh, we set up Drupal using Relaxed. Uh, this is Drupal 8.1, so we did need to have the cores module, and we used the deploy suite. And I'll show you how it gets in there. Ah, that's revisions. So um, one of the things that we had to do uh, within here is uh, set up the replicator role, and it comes with uh, Drupal core. So when you enable uh, the rep replication, um, here, do you, would you mind driving? Sure, sure. Cool. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, didn't actually have to write any Drupal 8 code. It was mostly came down to configuring the wonderful modules that we were uh, able to use. Um, so the rep replication module gives you a replicator role, which is basically permission to uh, replicate the data and, and, and pull it in. Um, so I think I think in our case we're just using user one, which kind of forces its way in. But you can kind of have some more fine-grained mm -hmm. per permissions that way. Yeah. I don't know where it is. The, <laughs> I hate the permission page. It's a mess. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Um, another thing was configuring relaxed web services. Um, you, this is basically the, in your connection string when you're initializing pouch, it's pointing to a Drupal endpoint. Uh, this is, forms the, the root of that connection string. Um, and you can set some permissions here as well. Uh, workspaces, this is kind of a cool module. Um, it allows you to have different workspaces or sort of database instances in a sense. Uh, we're just working with the live database, so when we make a change in our React app, We'll actually see it in Drupal immediately. Uh, you can have a, a staging workspace and kind of deploy between the two if you'd like. Um, another module we had to configure was the cores one, as we mentioned. Uh, so, so this is sort of security-related module. Uh, it allows, as the name says, cross-origin resource sharing to prevent you from accessing it. You, it's basically a whitelist of other domains that can access your site. Uh, so for our demo, you can see here we have localhost 8080, which is the local server we're running for our, our React app. Um, that was kind of the, the bulk of it. Um, so yeah, so really it's just configuring it. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Uh, no, that was largely mostly it once you got going. Uh, we ended up creating, uh, for this demo, creating a content type uh, called panel, which represents a solar panel. And um, there, uh, within there, Great. And you can see here the roles that we're creating. Uh, within there, that represents all of the content uh, that we have. So we have the different solar panels. Uh, we also created a test article because this is a standard Drupal install. Um, but you can see that we have different content types. And within the content type itself, well, wow, let's go to the Guinness factory. Um, that, that contains data that's being passed on to the application. So we have the full node on the React side. So you can see here that I have the Guinness factory um, and the solar panel I've reported as broken, broken 
and I'm, I have a uh, geolocation information stored within there. So on the React side, you can see here that uh, this is the entire React application that we have. We have a maintenance portal, and you can go in and you can inspect the Guinness factory to see what's going on there. And so here we have the data that's being passed back and forth between Drupal uh, and React. And you can see, as we mentioned before, uh, the heartbeat that we have that's connecting Pouch and Couch, or React, the JavaScript front end in Drupal. You can see how the network tab is pinging for changes. It, it basically pulls for changes, um, depending how you configure Pouch. Um, it's sort of, it's basically saying, are there changes, are there changes, are there changes? And if you make a change in Drupal, uh, eventually it'll get sort of a handshake back saying, yes, there are, here's the timestamp, here's the doc IDs that are different. Uh, and, and then there'll be a, a payload with the updated data. Um, and then Pouch has a nice little callback for when there are changes, and that's sort of our, uh, our trigger in React to update the state and reflect the changes that, that we've received back. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So this, uh, representing the React application, I'll go over to the code in and of itself. Uh, here I have um, a React, uh, my React application, and I would like to say, as I said before, I specialize in Drupal. I'm not a JavaScript specialist, <laughs> and I wrote this, so you can do it too. Um, Actually, how many how many people here have written a React app? Just okay, so everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> some people are familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're certainly not rock stars, but you know, we we got it done. <laughs> yeah. Um. What I would like to say, and I'll post this afterwards, is uh, I used uh, React um, Fundamentals. There's a tutorial called React, uh, React Fundamentals. And it's free. It's available online. Uh, I will send out the link later and update that. But uh, it was really, really, really easy for me to get started with it. So if you're a Drupal developer who hasn't worked in React a lot, uh, I highly recommend that as a tutorial. It's very clear. Uh, and React itself is just a beautiful application. So. I'm really happy that we're using it. Cool. So going through, uh, as I mentioned before, um, it's really simple to create uh, a pouch application here. Um, we have to require pouch at the top. And this is my uh, database helper file within my application. Um, and all of this code is available online. Uh, if you go to the GitHub repo, Aaron Marchek slash Drupal in the dark, it's connected to the, to the presentation. Uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, and give me tips. Um, but here, uh, we have the local DB, which I mentioned before, is just a string. Uh, the pouch DB, which I've represented here, in a terribly, terribly secure way, I am passing my username and password, which is testing, which is so secure, uh, to my Drupal instance. And then as we mentioned before, we configured the relaxed live endpoint. So relaxed is the endpoint, and live is the workspace. So you have the ability to switch between the workspaces, which is nice. We could connect it to <coughs> slash relax slash stage if yeah. we wanted. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to do a live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, as you can see here, uh, I mentioned before that that's uh, my user. I have a user representing uh, myself in Drupal that has the replicator role. Uh, and that role is required to actually have access to this pouch syncing. Once I have that, um, I have a library called DB Helpers that I've created. And within there, I have this function called get site data, which I use to sync. Um, and this syncing has the uh, retry flag, which is a uh, retry off offline. So when I disconnect, it's going to keep pinging as opposed to just shutting down, which is an option. Um, and then also live true, which creates that ping time. So in my home component here, which is the um, table that I've shown before, uh, I have a change function. So component did mount. Uh, for those who haven't used React in the room, um, that's actually you're able to call and identify when a component is loaded on the page, which is really nice. Um, when I notice a component is loaded on the page, this is an example of how I do a live change. Um, I then call the sync function, which allows me to sync, which checks if anybody else has changed anything on the page. And on a successful sync, I get a uh, change. So I've synced, I've noticed a change, and then I'm able to call a function uh, within there, or excuse me, to call a method within there and actually get a live refresh. So 
I have my maintenance portal. I have my Guinness factory, which is broken. This better work, guys. <laughs> it's the moment of truth. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, and I'll show you the live refresh, which is really, really nice. Doo -doo -doo. So I'm going to Guinness factory. I'm going to edit it in Drupal. Uh, so this is me pushing a live sync, and this is just having a live sync uh, on the endpoint. Uh, this is while you're connected. I'm going to tell them that the Guinness uh, factory panel is working. Just keep it there. <coughs> do, 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 do. And then once this submits, and we give wait a little ping time, yep. we have a live refresh on there, which is really, really nice. Um, and it gives you this really cool uh, idea of being able to con connect and talk to and engage with different uh, users of your application. Uh, inversely, I have uh, my Drupal side on my local. And I don't care what people tell me, I'm still using MAMP. <laughs> I'm going to stop my local host. So Drupal is offline. For sure offline. Uh, and then back on my React side, uh, I'm going to go through and I'm going to look at the, uh, the Dublin Conference Center. That's pretty good. And I'm going to say, no, nah, it's definitely broken. This panel doesn't work. So now we've, we've saved that change locally in Pouch, but it's going to wait for connectivity again for the yep. endpoint to be back up. I'm going to turn this on. Go back to admin content. Do, 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 do. And on the Drupal side, it does take a bit longer than the uh, React side. I'm going to see if the panel is right. I changed it to broken. I'm going to edit it. Go, 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 go. Your little MacBook Air is choking. It's trying. Makes fun of me. <laughs> um, so on the Drupal side, it does take a little bit of time. Um, if I flush caches, I bet it'll work. Or it'll break. Um, so this is just our Drupal side. You can see here, uh, we're including some additional items as we were experimenting. But overall, this is all that you really need to enable it. Yeah, it's broken. Two-way sync. I was really pleased with this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of the, the full round trip yeah. from both directions. Um, yay! Live yeah. demo. <laughs> and uh, you can see here on our network tab, on our network tab, <laughs> great. Uh, when you look at the thing, uh, this is the red items here are when we actually saw uh, an error where Drupal was offline, and it's able to target that. You're able to perform things on failed uh, syncing, uh, but it from the end user, it didn't see it. It didn't uh, change at all. It was a really nice, seamless workflow. Um, we get a revs diff, uh, and the other thing that I haven't implemented here, uh, but you are able to do, is actually target which uh, item was changed in your pouch database. Um, and then you can, since you're using React components, then you're able to actually rebuild the individual component on the page. So you're able to do really nice granular work. Back to slideshow. Cool. Um, so uh, we work in enterprise. Um, the question of security is here. Yeah. So you saw we had our connection string with the username and password hard coded right in. Um, obviously not ideal. There's there's some security implications uh, that we sort of thought about that might make it not enterprise or maybe even production ready, uh, um. although may maybe we did some things wrong too. Um, this is, I believe that first quote's from Google. Um, basically, data that can be accessible to unauthenticated, unauthenticated users makes an ideal candidate for offline storage. And that sort of makes sense. You know, if, if anyone can get to it, then there's no real uh, concern with having it in someone's pocket downloaded if they have a copy of it. 
Um, the other thing is, uh, because we wanted to have all the content available all the time, that means the whole database is transferred over the network and stored in local instance. So for an enterprise environment where you're reading and writing uh, protected information, there's, that's an issue. Yeah. Um, the other thing we did while researching this is that there's no role access control or ownership checks on CouchDB. In the CouchDB specification, you really have all or nothing. Uh, we found that um, when playing around with uh, Relax and Drupal, if I have uh, specific node permissions, so I have all my panels, panel node type on Drupal, and I have that one article, uh, I wasn't able to resolve, and this again, would love to talk to people after this, I wasn't able to resolve a way that I could just get the panels over, um, the panel node types over to Couch, I had to receive all of them. Uh, so within my uh, database here, you're able to, you're able to filter by the node type, which is absolutely fine, but in terms of uh, security, uh, that's something that we would want to have addressed. Yeah, because you're, you're essentially getting the whole database, and then our app does the filtering to say, hey, let's just show the panels. Uh, I yeah. guess you could present other things if you wanted. Uh, we, we did see it send uh, users as well. Um, Not anymore. Did we resolve? Okay. Yeah, Maybe I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, within there, uh, we also, uh, in general, the recommendation was you just filter uh, your content on the pouch side, and couch is very, very agnostic. The other way that they actually recommend to do it is to have multiple instances of couch, uh, <coughs> one per user. And so your pouch instance only syncs to the user's couch instance, and then you have Drupal. So um, that meant that we, to have a secure application, that means that we would fail at our goal of just having Drupal to couch at the moment. Uh, so in general, would we recommend exactly what we did for an enterprise application? No. Uh, <laughs> this was an exploration. Um, the security implications of having a full database being stored in the user and not being able to have control over that um, really suggests that uh, our approach is not the right way, and I would not recommend it. Um, but uh, the interesting part about that uh, is that there are some other things and tools that you can use to address these concerns. Um, we talked about that uh, afterwards, is relaxed um, pouch, that connection really enterprise ready. Um, I had the great pleasure this week of being introduced to IBM Cloud and to Envoy, which is a solution of this. It uh, represents different uh, pouch endpoints, uh, excuse me, represents different couch endpoints designed for a large enterprise environment. Uh, so you can theoretically create uh, multiple couch instances for each user that then sync back to Drupal and for your pouch uh, to actually sync. I have not done this. I just found out about this. I would love to hear more uh, from people that have used it or will use it and are looking into it. But that's um, one of the directions that we could uh, go to help solve this problem. Um, the other question that we have is, uh, is relaxed and pouch preferable over any other option? We're talking a lot about a lot of different options to actually get data out of Drupal onto it, and there's still a discussion about whether or not our, this technology stack is the best choice. Um, in general, uh, with any other option, they all are a document store in the browser that's available offline. Um, that base is pretty uh, easily measurable, whether or not you want to do it. Um, one of the negatives of choosing Pouch as a tech stack we found was the per document control. Um, there are issues out on uh, the Pouch G and Couch Jira. There are being addressed, that is being addressed, but it's not done yet. Um, the one thing that Pouch is just awesome at is how easy that sync was. Um, I've seen a lot of other examples where you have to handle the sync. Um, you have to handle the um, conflict resolution within there. And that's something that's done custom. Pouch does that for you. So in terms of a prototype, it was absolutely perfect. Um, but yeah. So looking forward, um, sort of our takeaway thoughts. Um, so Drupal's very good at managing content. Surprise, surprise. Um, so keep doing that. That's great. Um, but we are very interested in sort of this decoupled approach. Uh, so we like to say, uh, <coughs> unleash your front-end devs. You can kind of have them working on your Drupal products um, a lot more now. Um, I know at my plant, we have a, a great team of React developers, and so we can maybe start integrating those a little more into our uh, Drupal production teams. Um, and just a side note for people that are into it, there is CouchDB for uh, 
for native, Android and iOS. Haven't played with it myself yet, but it's out there. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So that's our presentation. Yeah. That's what we found. That's what we learned. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, let us know. Cool. And the, all of the code is available online, and the presentation is available online uh, for pull requests, suggestions, and anything. Cool. Hey, uh, I just had a quick question. More, not really something to do with the Drupal integration itself, but more about React. Like uh, something that I picked up a couple of months or weeks ago and had made in a Redis and I showed that in front of was that uh, Facebook actually has this rather nasty tapping clause in their license. And I was wondering, um, I think this issue is something that, that Learn from awareness in one end. I was just wondering if this is something that you guys have uh, yeah, thought about um, because I know that uh, basically what it comes down to for the people that are not aware of this issue, uh, Facebook has the right to revoke a license uh, for using React for an entire company if they feel that this company uses um, React to build any sort of competitor for Facebook. So any kind of social integration would fall under this, mm -hmm. under this provision. Um, is it something that you guys have, have actively considered, or? Honestly, no. Um, I don't think the sites we're building are really competing with Facebook, like a, a vacation planner, for example. Um, but that's a good point. Probably something to consider if we did have, uh, perhaps, maybe a socially orientated uh, client of some kind. But yeah, I actually was, was not aware of that, but good to know. something that we at, at Dazzle have already been talking about. Like for us, this is pretty much a no-go because there is really no really reliability in that one day we can just get it and say 2.16 and that's going to completely tell them to go back mm -hmm. yeah. there, so There's also the question about how far they're going to actually go to supporting the clause. If you have a comment, could you come up here uh, for the mic to make sure that's recorded? Um, but uh, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, it's if the clause is intentionally vague and if they haven't acted upon it, it'd be interesting to see what happens when they actually do and how far it's supported legally. Um, Does this work or is this recording? It works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, about the clause, I actually was looking at it at um, a different perspective, and I heard from a guy that actually said, like, if you want to use React on any client, you should get your lawyer, and it seems a bit like far-fetched and it seems a bit like, I don't know, a hot potato. But the thing is actually that um, in their clause, you don't have to be even a competitor. Let's say, for example, you use Facebook logins in your website, and all of a sudden they go, oh, uh, you guys use Facebook login. We kind of need more data that you guys stored from our users. Like, what did they do there? What did they do there? And then all of a sudden you have to kind of give in to Facebook. So it's like a big red button almost. And not even if it's Facebook or if you're going to sue Facebook or if um, you have two companies and they're basically competing against each other, they're both using React and then they get into a, some sort of a clause of, hey, I think you copied my design or you copied my code. You both have to drop React in your code, which is, again, a big red button. Mm -hmm. It sucks because React is awesome. <laughs> it is, yeah. I think that there's a, the nice thing about working with enterprises um, and some of them is that they do have a lot of um, power behind them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> bloat, bloat, power. Uh, it's a big ship, but if the ship starts going in a direction, it'll bring a lot of people with it. And the important thing is to remember that bullies don't win. Um, and that clause is such, uh, off, it's bad. It's it, like really not fair to sharing the community. And so if we run, run away from that, and if we don't address that clause as a group, um, then I think that it will never be resolved and it'll kind of be left there. Uh, in the same way that the, um, 
IBM employees challenge, not IBM, excuse me, uh, EA employees challenge the legal clause of no paying overtime for devs. It's not until you stand up for yourself that you can really have change. So, valid clause, but. Yeah, but I can't like explain to my clients. Yeah, but we should really stand as a group. Oh. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. Um, but in general, I found that the communicating the benefits of building technology uh, with React, uh, they're normally quite on board. And then if you say that there is a condition where this happens, uh, but we look at the benefits um, and the probability of it, uh, of being made an example of by Facebook of what that implication is, um, that's another way. So, um, my idea about it is like I agree with you that we should get behind this as a group in a way that we should drop React. Mm. I know in, in Dries' keynote he mentioned standardizing to Ember. Yep. Uh, I haven't worked with it, but I don't know. Maybe that's one of the considerations for that is all this, all this legal mess. Uh, pick something that's not controlled by Facebook. Unfortunately, Facebook is a bit of a fool. So I think for all of us, just be careful with it because it's, like Matthias said, um, it can come down to small things. It's not just Ember, but like Facebook or whatever. And so it can boil down to no, 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 it's an important discussion, thank you. Um, I would say the nice thing about this demo, uh, React isn't required, you only need Pouch and Couch, which uh, Couch is uh, Apache open specification, so um, mildly still valid, um, but you can pick and choose. Uh, so what, whether or not you feel comfortable on either side of the React discussion, uh, you can still use Pouch and Couch. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.